Property Investing Insights, your authority on all things property investing, finance and wealth creation with Wright Property Group. G'day, how are you going? Phil Tarrant, uh, co-host of Property Investing Insights with the Wright Property Group, our good friends over the Wright Property Group. I was only uh, just been on the plane actually and uh, landed in uh, Sydney Airport this morning, thinking about my day ahead and uh, and and how disappointed I was that I had to start the day uh, with a, a very uh, lackluster or unimpressive uh, uh, airport experience coming through customs. But uh, excited about getting together, uh, have a chat with uh, Steve Waters and Victor Kumar. They're the directors over the Right Property Group about all things property, financial management, wealth creation. You heard it in the introduction, but I was, I was sitting there thinking about how long I've been working with these guys for. It actually depressed me a little bit uh, in some ways because uh, Victor's got better looking. Uh, I think me and Steve have aged uh, horribly, but what has been <laughs> what has been a, a very uh, productive uh, aspect of our relationship is is the portfolio that uh, Right Property Group uh, helped me start from the very, very early days, which we're now in a process uh, within Smart Property Investment of shuffling the decks and repurposing um and i've been chatting with steve about that uh on the smart property investment show you can go and tune into it but um it just gave me a sense of uh how you're making the right decisions at the front end can really give you optionality uh, as you go through uh, property investing I, i'd say i'm midway through my property investing journey and, and i'm in a, a process now of, of repurposing the portfolio assets that i have to sort of create uh for the future but um uh, remiss of me because I think a lot of the discussions we have on on this podcast and and across the property investment podcast network is about the acquisition phase of property, how to do it, how to do it effectively, how to choose the right assets, uh, and and often we don't discuss as much as what we should do around what is the end state, what is what what is the exit strategy uh, when it comes to property investing. Everyone gets excited about uh, the buying bit, and most people a bit humdrum about the management bit, which can be quite fatiguing, but but we don't often chat about, okay, what do you do when you've created the portfolio? How do you actually leverage that optionality, that energy that you've got built up uh, and turn it into something which can give you what you want as a property investor? For many people, it's a comfortable retirement, what that looks like. Maybe it's um, uh, a regular uh, monthly income that you extrapolate out of your portfolio, you maintain it, maybe you sell down some debt um, and have an unencumbered portfolio, which... Uh, you can manage comfortably into the future. So today, I really wanted to focus on on the exit strategy. Uh, what do you do when you've done the first couple of bits of buying property well, buying the right properties at the right time and managing it effectively? What do you do when you want to actually cash out? Uh, and it's got to be an end to everything. The best investors I know, I'd like to think that I'm one of them because I've always built my portfolio with the right team around me has been always thinking what the end in mind is. And and the end in mind for me continually changes, um, irrespective of what's happening in business or my property portfolio. But the portfolio I've built has given me flexibility and optionality. And I'm a big fan of optionality because it allows you to move uh, in, a, in a dynamic and fluid environment. And that is something that you want. You don't want to be pegged in with a portfolio which is uh, locked in and you can't do much with it. So that's today's discussion. I don't know how often Steve and Victor talk about the exit strategy with their clients or maybe more about acquisition, but um, I don't know. Maybe we start there, Steve and Victor. How are you going? You well? Yeah, going well, mate. It's yeah. um, good to see that you had a fantastic experience through customs. I was, I was chatting with a person I was traveling with who you know quite well, and I was walking up to the gates, and I sort of said to him, um, you know, the problem we have today, it's that technology is so efficient that it's not keeping up with the analog part. Uh, of of international travel, like you, you get through, you get out of the plane. I was obviously at the front of the plane, Steve. You get out of the plane really quickly. Um, you you through you through into the baggage hall so fast these days, right? Then you still got to wait around for some baggage handlers to lift your bag out of a plane hold. So you still stand there forever. Uh, and then the 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 queues to get out were were ridiculous. I don't know if they're short staffed or whatever, but uh, I hope you guys don't give uh, that sort of experience with your clients. I've never felt that way, Steve. <laughs> had, that was well worked into, mate. I didn't know yeah, you, like that. you were going to with that. No, no, no. Well, you know, there's I don't think you did either. No, no. But, uh, you saw, a, you saw a, a gap and you went for it. Um, look, I think it's it's really important that that people do start with the end in mind, right? But I think often the end is is ever-changing. I mean, when we speak to to new clients, 
I would suggest that 99% of them, it's the end goal is always about a, a residual income. And usually they pair that through to their current wage because that's a tangible uh, item, I guess, to compare it to. But as I say to everybody, I can nearly guarantee you almost 100% of the time that your goals will change. And if the goal doesn't change, the sequence of goals change along the way. So if we take residual income as an example, saying, well, that's the holy grail. How do we get there? We map that out. But between now and then, you may get married. You may have triplets. You may want to upgrade your house. You might want to sail the world um, for two years, whatever it may be. So these these goals change. And what's super important is that the strategy that you create and deploy, and therefore the asset base has enough flexibility in it to be able to cater for those changes along the way. Bearing in mind though, that the, the asset class is one component of it. The economic ecosystem and environment at, at a particular time is equally important. And I guess that's why the, the, the exit strategy should really be talked about, I guess, a lot more and given more credence and attention um, than it does. I mean, most people tend to put a lot of the focus on the acquisition stage and that's mm -hmm. fair enough because that gets us going, but doing it blindly um, just doesn't give you the right outcome. I guess, and at the outcome, I guess, and you mentioned it, Phil, is all about optionality. Whatever that option is that you want to take at that given point in time, make sure that the asset class and the way that you create it caters for that rather than pigeonholing you into a certain moment in time uh, in your life or economy. Yeah, That's a short story. Uh, yeah, uh, optionality uh, is is absolutely critical. Um, and, and that optionality will change based on life um, uh, circumstances, uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, and, and this is the difference between, uh, I think, a buyer's agent and a, and a strategist, uh, and you guys are, are certainly uh, the latter, but you do the former as well as part of, um, you know, a holistic view of, of supporting your clients. Um, the, the strategy is it's, it's, it's unique to every single person. A lot of people will say, yeah, we, we play the same, apply the same formula to everyone. Well, the uniqueness of each individual, if you're a PAYG uh, employee, as in you get a paycheck every month uh, from, from from someone, uh, or you're self-employed is going to really dictate and determine what that optionality for you is going to look like uh, into the future. I imagine Vic, and, and I don't know whether you do this or not, but when you first sit down with a client, do you actually do you actually say, well, why why are you investing in property? Do, do most people have an answer? Look, most people don't actually have an answer because it's mm. not something that 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 is tangible at that moment. It's only as the portfolio starts unfolding that they realize, hang on, I, I I've actually got this. It, this is this is something that I can actually achieve. Um, whereas in the initial stages, most people, uh, until they are um, educated with the right education, focus more on the buying. Where do I want? To, where do I want to buy? You know, I want to get into the property market. And uh, one of the first things Steve and I say is that it's very easy to get into the property, right? Very easy to purchase. Much harder to get out of the property in a sense. So we've got to look at it from that viewpoint. So. Really, we're talking two exit strategies. One is an unplanned um, in terms of, okay, if things went pear-shaped, you know, what can we do in the portfolio to get ourselves out of trouble without uh, losing substantial money? They're, they're, you know, depending on the timing of, of uh, things going wrong, uh, you may um, have some battle scars. Uh, in most cases, you can come through relatively unscathed from a financial point of view. Then the other exit strategy, of course, is the true um, holy grail right now if you look at the earlier books the earlier seminars everyone talks about the holy grail of property investing which is you know positive cash flow right um, and uh, over the years the message has been lost in the sense that positive cash flow does not mean that every property is positive right and we're not talking about in you know, 20 dollars a week positive uh, where one repair blows out your your positive cash flow um, it's more in terms of debt retirement. Perhaps a better explanation is debt retirement. And uh, the reality of it is that um, depending on when you have started, there may be some residual debt that you're taking into retirement as you continue working, as, as, as you scale down your PAYG or employment or, or your gainful employment as such, and uh, taking more advantage of the investment income that you've that you've unencumbered, right? 
Uh, and uh, there's several approaches in that sense. But the bottom line is that you've got to create the money somehow uh, to actually pay down the mortgages. There's no secret about it. There's no magic formula. It's more of a planned approach of, uh, okay, I've now got $2 million, $3 million, $5 million worth of investment debt. I may or may not have a uh, owner-occupier debt. And, and now's the time to start seriously thinking about, okay, where's this heading uh, in terms of fruits fruits of my labor? Not, not how much the property has gained in value, but how much the property portfolio can enhance your lifestyle, right? And lifestyle enhancement can only be done with the folding stuff, right? So in other words, you need to get to the money, not the equity. So cash flow uh, as such. Um, and, and it could be that, um, you know, there, there is some strategic sales, sell downs uh, in conjunction with advice from an accountant and financial planner uh, so that you minimize the tax impact of it. Um, and, and you're living off that uh, over a period of time as you work on the balance of the portfolio. Or it could be more of a really uh, hound down approach. Let's focus on this property. Let's barrel this mortgage down. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about a few strategies uh, later in the podcast in terms of how to barrel the mortgages down. Um, or it could well be that, okay, now I've, I've set this portfolio aside. I really am not in a rush. Um, and particularly, the, and this is more particular for for business owners than PAYG, unless you, you, are, you are a substantial income owner as a PAYG. It's more down the track of, okay, I'm going to squirrel away part of my profits, my part of my uh, surplus income into this mortgage and let time do its magic. So there are many, many exit strategies, uh, but it boils down to one simple thing. Got to pay off, pay off the mortgages. Yeah, it's it's absolutely critical. And um, uh, yeah, and, and I think this this notion of, of optionality is key. And you've spoken about three or four different ways that you can retire debt um, to be unencumbered as much as possible. So the money you make from your investment property goes into your back pocket rather than paying down a mortgage. And I, you know, using an analogy, Steve, of going through customs, just thinking about it, you know, you get you get you get the front bit right really well, um, but then you hit a roadblock and you get stuck and things slow down and you lack options. Um, depends on uh, what baggage you're carrying. As and well. it depends on what baggage. Well, I carry a lot of baggage, particularly this friendship. <laughs> but um, <laughs> ten years of this has been a it's a heavy burden to carry. Just the counseling. Uh, just the counseling. <laughs> Maybe we should name this uh, property counselors with Phil Tarrant. Tell me all your problems, Steve. Tell me how bad your portfolio. Do you have optionality in your portfolio, Steve? You, Absolutely. You, yeah, and and, and 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 not to go into details about it, but but how would you frame optionality when you consider your portfolio, which in many ways, and I I know a little about your portfolio, um, it's consistent with how you approach, um supporting your clients um you know irrespective yeah. of where they are the, look the optionality that that or the route that i went down uh, and encourage a lot of people to do the same is in around obviously growth which is brackets equity um it's around potential cash flow because you don't start with it mm. uh, and it's also about manufacturing now that's really important because somewhere in i believe in portfolios you need that ability to be able to force the market and not just rely upon organic growth. So that's manufacturing. So whether that be something that needs a renovation, whether it's a land bank uh, opportunity for future development, the optionality is exactly that, is what options do I have in all markets? So an example of that could be that um, as we rolled off the, the COVID money from 2% to 6%, maybe the optionality or the options that that some have, hopefully lots, was to then put secondary incomes onto certain properties to boost that income for that particular property and negate to some degree that sort of out-of-pocket uh, negative cash flow because of interest rates going up. Now, side note, we should have always known that 2% was never going to last forever. So there should have been mitigation and options in place for that moment in time as well. But the point, I think something that people really need to understand is that if we replace the word with options and let's say it's retirement, right? Whether it's before or after the legal retirement age, you don't want retirement to be an age. You want it to be an equation. Mm. Like that's the important facet here. And that equation is in around your financial position given that period of time. So how do we get to it other than just purchasing? Because that's obviously a prerequisite and mm. a very important part of it. But how do we, make 
moves strategically and methodically along the way, along the journey, so to speak, so that we hit that equation. And that could be, as Victor touched on, whether it be development, whether it be selling some assets at a point in time like you have, uh, whether it be as the market is in peak fear, we actually adjust our strategy to pick up the crumbs of peak fear in terms of the assets because we know what's around the corner to then earmark those properties uh, to be sold on as an example. And I'll, actually, I'll give you an example. So if we go way back to the GFC, Victor and I made the strategic decision to buy and sell a raft of properties. Right? That was the way that we were also adding to our portfolio, but we wanted to buy and sell properties, commonly known as flipping, right? And we did, well, Vic, how many did we do during the GFC? Close to 200. 200 uh, properties. In half. Yeah, buy and sell properties, right? Now that mm -hmm. took yeah, clearly a lot of experience, but there was it, it wasn't done for giggles. It was done strategically. Now, and what that did is it created capital, it created equity, it created profit to pay down existing mortgages or then set the portfolio up by purchasing others for the future, right? Now, it's not something that we would advocate for everybody to do because, you know, we've got a little bit of experience in doing that, but it's a timing piece, right? And we haven't seen that timing piece in terms of the GFC again to be able to do that, to be able to flip properties. And I know there are some people out there that do it. And I know a lot of the Americans do it, but we've got a very different ecosystem. And once again, we haven't seen that timing piece to be able to do that again. The downside of flipping slash trading properties is that once they've, once they've done their job and they're fit for purpose and you've sold them and hopefully you've made some money, you fast forward to today and they've all tripled and quadrupled in value. Yep. So yep. it's hence, something that you, the... you can't look back. That's right. Hence the adage, never, ever sell, right? But you're selling to a purpose. You're not selling just for selling, for the sake of selling, right? And 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 I think, um, uh, Phil, if I take you back to your initial comment, right, it, it, what you do in the front end determines how the, how the end looks, right? So if I look at someone that's starting, uh, and particularly in today's climate where interest rate is a concern, right? We've got inflation working against us. We've got uh, loans that we can and can't qualify for working against us. Um, it is really important um, to net, not get caught up in the psychological game of saying, you know what, I I, I can qualify for 900,000, but I'll only buy a 500 type property because it's going to be cheaper um, and, and I'll be less committed into in the capital, right? Uh, traditionally, um, if you look at uh, in today's market, the 500 may be in a less demographic based on your borrowing capacity, right? So in the initial stages, as you're starting out the portfolio, you'll be focusing more on growth. Cash flow is still a, is still a factor there. Uh, you want to have good growth prospects with reasonable cash flow um, from that property, right? Once you've got these big rocks in the jar and big rocks in place, we now need to fill in the smaller rocks, right? So this is one, uh, once you've got a few growth properties. And the reason why you'd focus more on that initially is that you need to take the approach that you're only able to buy one property, right? So you take the best bang for buck based on your borrowing capacity, based on previous growth data, and uh, based on our ground research, the prospect of future growth. And also, talking about the exit strategy of that property if it does go wrong, if life goes wrong, right? Not talking about retirement exit. I'm talking about exit out of the property if life goes wrong. So we need to address those things. Then we're filling in that 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 um, jar that we're creating with the smaller rocks. In other words, we're balancing out the cash flow, right? So we may go on, perhaps we, we're actually building a granny flat to bring down the negative cash flow. So we've, we've got both, right? We've got the equity growth now. We've got lesser negative cash flow to then go on to repeat the process, right? So it is it is more of, okay, yes, we deliberately got into negative cash flow. Then we drilled that down, got into negative cash flow again, and we've now got, say, um, close to what our gross income aim was from the portfolio. Now we need to seriously look at, okay, let's get rid of all of the negative cash flow, which is the next step. Once you've done that, now the pressure's off. Now we can start working on, okay, how do we pay these mortgages off? 
do we get into because now we've got the experience we've built a granny flat as an example or we've done a renovation or maybe even we've done a simple subdivision do i repeat that why reinvent the wheel or do I take advantage of how the market is panning out? And a good example of that would be during the COVID frenzy. Uh, jump in, buy a, quite a few more properties, hold it for one cycle, uh, and a strategic offload. Now, you're taking advice up front in, in the sense that if your pure intent is to sell down this property in the short, uh, short to medium term, definition of short being 18 months plus, um, you, you, are, you are really taking into account what the tax event is going to be when you sell. Right, so you're not unnecessarily giving away all of your profits. You you're legally reducing the tax burden when you sell. The biggest um, uh, thought process, the negative thought process people have when you mention the word sell is, um, I'm going to pay capital gains tax when I sell. Can I suggest next time you have that thought, if you're POYG, pull out your pay slip, have a look at your pay slip. You're paying tax already when you earn money. So if you're earning money and you're paying tax, it's a good thing. Just minimize the tax. Legally. Legally, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, our, to, to our good friends at the ATO who I know tune into this podcast, keep up the good work. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's nice that um, property investors could be an engine for simulating economic growth through uh, the tax receipts they generate. But um, I, I did see a thing in the paper just very briefly while I was on, um, flicking through my phone that uh, uh, someone tried to claim deductions just using credit card statements and the ATA doesn't like that very much. So uh, you need to make sure that you're very diligent about um, how you manage your tax affairs. But uh, just two observations um, uh, listening to you, Victor, uh, chat then um, with, with a view towards this notion of, of optionality. And look, we're, we've, you, you guys are much more experienced than, than I am around property, but you know, three people who are very comfortable um, working in and around property and, and acquired experience, we 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 bandy around terms like, you know, like they're this, you know, simple terms, but are very very deep and complex. So you know, we're, we're chatting about you know pretty detailed stuff here when it comes to optionality and different different strategies, different ways you can retire debt. Um, so uh, a lot of this might be bewildering for a lot of people. So um, uh, that leads myself to the second point: the reason why you need someone on your side to actually help you navigate all these type of things, because you know it is complex. Um, and and yeah, you know, the question I have for you, Victor, is this notion of optionality is great, um, but optionality sometimes means that you have too many options, which can de stifle decision making. Uh, therefore, it makes it very difficult to to set a pathway for a strategy. So you know you can't have one strategy that allows you to do absolutely everything in time. You've got to actually have a principal purpose for the strategy, yep. Um, and then, then, then really just trade around the edges. Uh, because if you create a strategy that gives you the options to do everything, you'll never go anywhere, and you'll probably end up blowing all your dough. I imagine. But um, what, what do you say to that? Look, at uh, I agree. Too many options is bad, right? Because you really, you really can't make a decision, right? Uh, um, there was a long time ago. I, I read a book, and and it said that if you give someone two options very hard for them to make decisions, right? But if you gave them three options, that they're okay. If you gave them one option, um, again, hard to make decisions. If you gave them more than three, it's very hard to make decisions, right? Because you don't know which one's the right one. Um, the, at, at, the, at the end of the day, um, really, you need to be making sure that what you're doing and the strategy that, you, uh, that you're employing at that point in time in that market, at that, that uh, cycle, is in line with what you're really trying to achieve. And you're not selling for the sake of selling just to see how much money you've made or, or whether the strategy does work uh, or anything like that, right? Um, if you look at how to reduce that, there is only four ways to reduce that, right? Through surplus PAYG or business income. The second is through surplus portfolio income. So in other words, um, as your property is, property rents become higher and the rates start coming down, you selectively turn uh, some properties into um, uh, uh, principal and interest. And this could be a good scenario. It could be once you've built a granny flat on one of the properties or done a subdivision, done a second dwelling, uh, you turn that portion into principal and interest and let time do its magic, right? The third is um, um, you sell something, you know, cars, bananas, in our case, properties, right? We sell properties. We, we deliberately go out, buy properties. It may be that we're selling one that we already have and retain the new one that we've bought, new as in new, not not brand new, uh, the new to the portfolio. Um, the fourth, of course, you win lotto, right? It hasn't worked for me so far. Um, you've got to be in. You, you, you play the lotto. You play the lotto, wouldn't you? 
big every I, I play I play property lotto, not yeah. not uh, Aussie <laughs> lotto. <laughs> <laughs> and the fa- and the and these uh, odds are stacked in my favor when I play property lotto. Yeah, I, I don't think you play property lotto. You you would you'd play if, if you were playing a game property. You'd um you'd be something like uh I reckon I reckon if I look inside your brain, look like Chinese checkers, mate. I've been playing out the kids <laughs> lately, uh, which is a very uh <laughs> a very complex and strategic uh game um where you're. Uh, you're attacking and defending simultaneously, right? Um, but yep, with, with, with one, we are, with with one dice, you, uh, sorry, one piece, you you clearing the board for the you can move, yeah, you you can move, you can jump, you can you know, depending yeah. how well you set it up, you can maneuver through it all. But yeah. um, anyway, there's lots of analogies. And, 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 sorry, uh, Phil, I, I like that analogy, but because if you're looking at Chinese checkers, right, sometimes you're deliberately sacrificing some of some of the pieces to set yourself up to clear the board. Yeah, that's a good point. And that comes back to his other good point, which I don't even think he realized he made, is that you are actually attacking and defending mm. at, the, at the same time. And that's a really, really good analogy of creating a portfolio because you're defending the cash flow, you're defending your position, and you're attacking brackets acquiring when you can quite strategically. The thing that that continually amazes me when I sit back and think about it, especially with short-term strategies, is is that we spend like 45 years in the workplace, in the work environment. However, we get, or a lot of people get really, really itchy feet when it comes to short-term knee-jerk reactions to market conditions. And we can see that now. Mm. Like people have perhaps bought a property, two properties, whatever it may be. And because they haven't defended their position well enough, they're now caught in a moment in time. And we can see this in some of the data that investors are fleeing the market because of clearly several reasons. And the holding cost being at the absolute epicenter uh, of it all. So attacking and defending is is very, very important. And if just those people had set themselves up correctly to begin with in terms of buffers and liquidity, which we speak about all the time, they wouldn't be having the, I guess, the initial thought process of having to sell versus wanting mm. to sell. Big difference. Massive yeah. difference. And Massive. this comes back to um, using a, this analogy of you know, board games, whatever it is. What, what is the objective? Um uh, and this comes to my earlier point. Yeah, you know, when when you sit down with a potential client, first first time you get with them, well, you know, I, I don't know if you did it with Steve, with me, Steve, but why are you investing in property, Phil? Oh, I don't know, because I think it's the right thing to do to try and make some wealth. I got no idea how it's going to play out, but you know, it seems like the right thing to do. Uh, and I'll and I'll and I'll work it out over time. Which I remember, is... I actually remember meeting with you the first time, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I remember yeah. that it was McDonald's Penrith, I think. It yeah, was. Well, there we go, and that's where so, I do my best work. It does. You were flipping <laughs> but, fries. But, 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 but you know what's funny? You, you talk about Sundays. <laughs> you talk about you talk about McDonald's um, uh, Penrith, um, and and I spent many weekends with you early doors, like lurking around the uh, the western suburbs of Sydney in the the heady days of the late GFC, where uh, where buying was buying was good. So take me back there. I'm, would have bought yeah. ten times as many properties as what I did, but we'll go into that. Um, but but one of the properties we we purchased there, and this is it's important. This is this this notion of optionalities at all at all layers, whether it's optionality at a strategic level, as in okay, the objective is to retire to debt and have an unencumbered property. How do you do it? You've probably got three or four pathways to do that. Um, but everything comes down to the choices you make and the decisions you make at at every single level of your portfolio. And I would say to actually have a decent conversation and productive conversation around, okay, how am I going to use my portfolio now to retire? Everything comes back to asset selection at the front end and your ability to to um, um, manage debt around it. And I think of that property that that you purchased for us, Steve, um, back in Cambridge Park, which we recently sold and, and was sort of speaking about on the Smart Property Investment Show. You probably remember the numbers better than me, but we, we bought it for $236,000 um, couldn't get finance on it because the bank said it was uninhabitable. We could only get two hundred grand on it. I remember sitting there thinking, "How am I going to find thirty six thousand dollars to cover the gap?" Anyway, we did a forty odd thousand dollar renovation on it. We sold it recently for just under eight hundred by by memory. Like that asset selection was a good one. You you guys saw the opportunity for it, um, and you saw the upside potential on it, which was to manufacture equity. And that was a manufacturing equity market. Uh, it's probably about the same time you guys were flipping a lot of property, I would imagine, yeah, where, you could, where, where you could manufacture immediate equity and get the uplift, whether through a, a revaluation of the property, which we did, pull money out, or you flick it on. So 
every single time you have to get that asset selection right for why you're doing it, how you can get the upside on it. And, and that's the bit that most people like talking about, right? Like, what am I going to do with it? How am I going to make some money? You know, how's it going to lend itself to it? But um, one in, what, what was it? Um, most Australian property investors only have two properties, right? One and two yeah. properties. So, so most people get the asset selection wrong. Uh, and if there was a critical success factor to come to property, that there was one thing is that you've got to buy your first and second properties need to be the right properties to give you the optionality to have a discussion around long-term retirement through a property portfolio uh, into future. Why, Victor, do people still get it so wrong, do you think, at the front end? Well, they, they, they're following the hoard, mm. right? So if everyone's buying in Perth or everyone's buying in Sydney, they want to buy there because apparently that's where uh, the action is, right? So not, first of all, they're not buying within their means. They're not also uh, looking at it from beyond the one property, right? They're, they're so concerned about, okay, I'm going to get into $800 million debt uh, or $500,000 debt, um, and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the end, right? Because they equate that debt to their home loan debt, right? So if you've got a million dollars in, in home loan in, in your own occupied property, you've got stump up the full mortgage repayments of that, right? What they really should be equating it is to what they need to stump up in terms of the differential between the money coming in, the rent, and 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 the and the money going out. So the mortgage repayments, uh, council rates, water rates, all, all, all that nice stuff. Um, so by following the herd, uh, you, you, you are actually uh, doing yourself a disservice, right? So um, more than likely, you need to be counter-cyclical on two counts, right? One, counter cyclical in terms of okay more counterintuitive right it, it, in in the sense that if everyone say tacking towards cash flow positive uh, cash flow neutral cash flow positive properties um might be maybe the better option would be to get into a better higher growth property if you can afford it right and then also equally importantly it, it uh, the other um uh, cycle that you need to look at is your age cycle right because if you are advanced in your years like Steve is, uh, mm -hmm. you, you would. Let me you just would remind certainly... everybody: you're the oldest on the on the show. <laughs> I'm the I'm the I'm the younger looking person here. Um, the um, the idea is that you, you want to be buying a property where you're not totally reliant on the market doing what it does, right? So you want to give it a helping hand if you're more advanced in age. So that would potentially mean that you, you, you're buying a Cambridge Park where it, it looks looks rough and ready, um, but you're making it uh, nice and pristine and, and uh, more attractive to, to the owner occupier because ultimately that's your end buyer, right? It's not necessarily your, your investor as such. It, your own occupier is usually your end buyer. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's a unit, whether it's a house, whether, whether it's, it's a a large block of land or a small block of land, it comes back to what uh, what goes in that area, right? So the area, the type of property in relation to the, the money that you can get and, and your age bracket uh, determines uh, how well you really do. Again, the decision-making, every single step of the way, you got to get it right. Um, mm -hmm. or at least got to get eight out of 10, I, I would imagine. Um you know, and it's 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 mind-boggling just how how many snares there are along your way as a property investor where you can get tripped up and just make the wrong calls. Um, you know, we've spoken about it at length, Steve. It's about having a resilient portfolio, though, isn't it? And and scale often lends itself to a more resilient portfolio. But you just got to get just got to get moving and get going because once you sort of get sort of three, four, five properties the the optionality and, and and the tactics you could deploy for growth uh, and manufacturing growth uh just become so much more expansive but it's it's hard it's hard to get there it is it's really hard, hard to get, get there it's hard to start to be honest with you and even mm. in today's environment if we if we take today's environment it is hard to start there is no doubt because you know, borrowing capacity has been hampered dramatically from what it was 18 months ago to five years ago right and so when you've got a market that's increasing in value and limited borrowing capacity, it can force you into certain areas to potentially purchase that may not be adequate for you. Hmm. So an example of that might be that um, yeah, you can borrow $400,000. Um, you've got your heart set on a freestanding dwelling. There are not many places 
that I can think of, if any, on the off the top of my head, where I would comfortably park four hundred thousand dollars in debt in a house and in a house and expect it to be uh, expect it to be a good asset over the medium and long term. I think a lot of those areas at the circa four hundred thousand dollar mark now for a house will perform well in the short term just because of the dynamics we have today in the ecosystem being not enough supply. and, and to, So you're talking about Perth? Well, it could be anywhere. You can do it in a lot of different states and territories. Um, yeah. But the important point there is it's not just about the short term. This comes back to the knee-jerk reactions, you know, 45 years in the work for, in the workspace, but we'll make these small and quick, rapid decisions mm. based on tomorrow. The medium term and the long term is where the asset growth is because of the compound growth and what have you. And if we can help it along the way in some circumstances with you know, maybe a renovation or a secondary dwelling or whatever we've mentioned before, that obviously goes a long way. But if you're not getting the growth, then the if it is a renovation, if it is a secondary dwelling, it's really not going to be, you know, the juice isn't worth the squeeze as we've talked about before. Um, so that asset selection with the right price bracket is super, super important. It's not Matt, it's just not a matter of getting into the market because that's all I can afford. Mm. Yeah. It, and maybe the analogy or an example um, perhaps is, and I'm just using general numbers here just for the example, would I, would I buy a $400,000 house in Humpty Doo that might do well now, but, potentially not over the medium and long term, or would I buy $400,000 a unit in a well-located area in a small complex? Mm. You know, that's the challenge, you know, is getting it right for the long term. And i tell you why, because most people, you know, they want to throw around figures of, well, you know, we get between 6.3 and 6.8% compound annual growth since Captain Cook got here. That's the historical data. However, they assess, assume, and model that out on a lineal basis that you're going to get it every year and you don't you'll get 12 percent. give back four get nothing get five and so on and so forth so whilst the trajectory is up it's not in a lineal approach it's lumps mm. and bumps along the way but that's the asset growth part of it that's the bit that makes you feel nice between your ears but what you do also get are the lumps and bumps in terms of the cash flow position because of the two bookend scenarios one being interest rates which clearly affect uh, the cash flow sort of circle within that portfolio or within that dwelling. But then there's also the rents. And this is the other point. So people, whilst they approach it with a straight line approach in terms of growth, um, they also do the same on the income side of things. And they say, well, rents grow by 3.7% per year. They don't. And I'm just making up that number, mm -hmm. but rent does not grow every year, year on year out. And I can give plenty of examples where I've had properties where the, there was zero growth in the rent for five years. Mm -hmm. Sure. They've, they've caught up now. And when I reverse image it, the growth looks quite good, but it's at those moments in time where there's zero growth in rent. Perhaps there's a combination of zero growth in the asset value because of economic conditions and rates have gone up and there's the inflection point where it sorts the men from the boys or the girls yeah. from the women. I agree, Steve. In, 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 uh, you know, the importance of this is reflected on, um, you know, if you're just taking the linear approach, the importance of this is strongly reflected on when you actually do start to invest, right? What age you actually start to invest and what capital you've got to get, uh, get started, right? And, and if you just focused on just purely, you know, I've got 400K to spend, I want to buy a house, everything will work out right now, right? The market is so short supplied, everything will work out right now. But what's on the other side of this curve is what you need to be focusing on. So when the supply corrects, which will be in the in probably within less than the decade, right? Because we're throwing everything and anything at this at this problem right now. When that supply problem is fixed, how does it pan out in terms of your rental? How does it pan out in terms of the liquidity of your asset? And what I mean by that is your ability to sell down when you do need to sell down. Now, whether, again, whether it's planned or unplanned. So we need to be looking at those factors when we're putting in the, particularly the initial assets within the portfolio. Um, as the portfolio grows, you can afford to speculate a little bit, right? And, and But you, you take a very calculated speculation towards it. 
Um, but more and more important is is the fact that you need to be looking at it from a viewpoint of, okay, I will buy these properties, not get caught up in the number of properties, but still there needs to be multiple properties in different areas so that the cycles work for you. So what I mean by that is e even if you're just investing within the one state, you want to be investing in different council areas, different demographics, right? Because demographics change, um, the, the outlook of suburbs change. Uh, and uh, what you're really looking for is when you're investing in an area is the price point differences. What's the brand new selling for? And you're picking up an older property with um, better metrics. So if it's a unit, you know, if all the units are 50 square meters, you're picking up a 70 square meter, much older, better better um, uh, flow unit as such. Or if it's a house, if uh, you know your standard brand new homes are spelling, uh, selling for, and I'm making these numbers up, uh, one and a half mil, uh, and they're sitting on 250 square block of land. Uh, if you're able to secure a 450 square block of land for 800, older house, uh, not as flash and pristine looking, maybe that's a better option than than buying this flashy brand new home. Yeah, I mean that even raises the point, Vic. If we look at today's market, yeah. So and I and I sort of touched on this a little earlier on the podcast around yeah peak fear creeping into in some areas peak greed. Mm -hmm. right? Now it's that greed component of the market, which will perpetuate it. And imagine if we've got that today in some markets, imagine what happens when the, the finance environment changes. Yeah. Like, so that peak fear has, I believe been and gone. I mean, there are some parts of the media that are really trying to keep it there. And I guess in some areas, you know, it's, it's definitely warranted. Um, but as we transition from that peak fear moment, to a perpetuating moment, which will eventually get to a peak greed moment. That's when you're going to really start to see and be, well, sorry, that's when you've got to be really, really careful coming back to your point around, is this short-term market sustainable for the medium and long-term? What does it look like mm -hmm. on the other side? As you yeah. mentioned it. Because it's, it's a good point, Steve. Let's just pick up this idea of fear and greed. So, <laughs> um, so you're saying that the fear has been, Interest rates going up. Everyone's not going to be able to afford their mortgages. Interest rate cliffs. All that. All that sort of narrative. Um, but I've seen some stuff coming through. Pretty much going. Australians are still ahead of their mortgages. You know, it's it's not as bad as what everyone thinks. Um, so now there's this calibration of maybe neutrality of okay, well, the the sky's not falling in. Let, let's just steady the ship and and continue as usual. What you're talking about is when this greed is when people start going, it's back to FOMO land. It's a fear of missing out. I've got to get in. I've got to get in, got to get in, got to get in. Now you, you've both spoken about on this podcast about this, the the fundamentals for why you think there's going to be an acceleration of, of prices moving forwards. Um, and some people uh, subscribe to that theory. Some people don't subscribe to that theory, but your, your position is there's going to be a period of sustained growth moving forward. Is that going to be driven by the greed in some part? That's a really good point. I think it'll be driven by necessity. And that necessity point is supplying roofs on people's heads. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, a, that's just, we all know that. That's a, that's and there's not fact. enough of them. Yeah. And that's a fact, right? But yeah. that'll also be stoking people's greed. Right. Now, we've got to be very careful in the way that we um, frame this, frame greed, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, greed could, for some could be, well, I just, you know, want to be the Gordon Gecko of the property world. Um, if you don't know who that is, go watch Wall Street. Um, and some people's you know, analogy of greed is I just want to get ahead. Mm. I just, you know, and I'll, which is okay, which is fine. Right. And, and I will leverage off other people's greed. Yeah. Mm. So whichever way you want to frame it, but what I'm really, really mean by greed is don't let greed overtake common sense. Yeah. Right. Still make those methodical and strategic decisions based on the medium and long term. And sure, if you get some quick wins, leverage it sensibly. But know that yeah, this is a this is an over and above normality position, uh, and we need to account for that. And COVID is an example of that. And you could throw in the interest rates from you know two percent to six percent, right? If you didn't know that was coming, you'd had your head buried in the sand. Or if you go back further, that APRA was eventually going to release the handbrake. They had to. Mm. Um, if you go back further, the GFC was going to end. Yeah, so on and so forth. There is a million, well maybe not a million, but there's dozens of examples of crises where you can take advantage of, um, not just during the crisis, but also as it unwinds 
from itself. But just don't let you know greed and ego get in the way of good decisions. And that's mm. key. But Victor, how do you how do you have self awareness where you might be sort of falling into this um uh being blinkered by greed uh, when you start compromising your decision making uh, on the basis of whether it's to capitalize on on um, market conditions uh, in a negative way and or become that greedy person making poor buying decisions or asset selection decisions, poor uh, timing decisions and poor debt decisions. You know, you need to have that self-awareness. Um, yeah, and that's what the best investors do. Hmm. Yeah. Look, Steve and I have a very simple formula. It's the three ifs, you know, if it's going to do this, if it's going to do that, and if it's going to do that, uh, it'll work out. You know, if there are too many ifs on it, then it's not going to work out because you're now speculating, right? So mm -hmm. it has to be a bit of certainty. Uh, then also, you need to be pre-recognizing potential cycles, right? Uh, understanding that um, you'll have mini debt consolidations along the way, right? So you, if you if you look at, uh, you know, what's being forecasted by most banks, um, there is a definite cycle emerging right now that could be opportunistic, right? So right now we can understand the cash rate is 4.1%, and that translates to 7% in, in real interest uh, as such. But if you look at what the banks are predicting, right? So CBA is an example. They, they're predicting that next year, between March and December, the cash rate will drop from 4.1 to 3.1. So 1%, uh, so that translates to um, quite a bit of reduction in interest rate. For the consumer, Westpac is saying that you know from September 2024 to December, uh, the rate, the cash rate will drop to 3.6 percent from 4.1, uh, and NAB's predicting that between August um, uh, 24 to Feb 25, um, the cash rate will drop to 3 percent. Right. So we know that there is a reduction happening in terms of interest rate in the coming year. Right. Um, you know, whether it is actually next year or the year after, but we know that it's definitely there, provided inflation comes in. And, and if you look at inflation, the prediction is that um, by December 2023, 20, this, this year, we'll be down to four and a half. And by uh, mid-2025, uh, we'll be in the mid-threes in terms of inflation. Now, these data can change because there's quite a few variables, right? But we know that now these two things are dovetailing in terms of how it'll pan out the property market because we are hugely undersupplied. Immigration is next level. It, it is putting so much pressure on rental that even uh, even uh, states like Victoria are really looking at uh, the granny flat rules in that sense, right? And and uh, states like Queensland uh, in the Moreton Bay area they are allowing granny flats to be rented out to a third party, which that that they hadn't allowed in the past years. So we got all of these dynamic changes happening in that sense. So it makes absolute financial and investment sense to with the qualification of buying within your means to control as much as many assets as possible growth assets as possible in this time frame between now and say end of next year because we know what's happening on the other side the other side is finance is going to get easier and when in, in the previous podcast we, we've talked about the three things that tend to click in because everything else is in there, right? So the three things that needed to be clicking in was the immigration, which we've now got. Um, uh, it needed government incentive, which we now got come 1st of July uh, with the shared equity scheme. So the third thing that needs to click in to make it an absolute 100% checklist, check, checklist tick boxes done um, for, for long sustained growth in property uh, is when finance becomes easier to get right so right now finance is harder to get so people aren't trying that hard and they're saying no i still want to stick with my cbas my Westpacs, my my um uh, sun corps they're not looking at their second and third tier lenders um, mind you you don't want to get yourself into such a situation that you can't afford the repayments you need to be buying within your means but look at the other lenders get into the asset because it'll pay the dividends right so if you look at it from an exit point of view this could be a short term you know, uh, it, uh, getting into the property and, and getting into two and exiting out of one to reduce your mortgage on one and then coming back and perhaps building the secondary dwelling on it. Yes, you're increasing your mortgage yet again, but you're now substantially increasing cash flow. It can be as simple as that. What's there? What do you do next? 
<laughs> how do you know? How do you know if you're down the right pathway? This is where it gets complicated. If you're, a, well, I, I think you're, you've got to educate yourself, and eventually you've just got to take a step or not. Yeah, it it, it can be as simple as that. But yeah, you know, taking that step or coming back to the education point, education is around your financial capabilities. It's around your goals. It's around the process and your psychology. Uh, and the psycho that's actually a huge point. And we've spoke about this before is, you know, a lot of people's relationship with debt just isn't there. Mm. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people and, you know, in our space want to say, well, take the, take the emotion out of it, take the emotion out of investing. It's just numbers, but you know, that's just not possible unless you're not right in the head. There's, that was a very simple way to put it, I guess, but there's always going to be motion attached. And if it's not to the dwelling, it'll be to the debt in some way, shape or form. Wow, I've got another zero to my name. How am I going to pay this off? Interest rates are up. So there's always that ongoing emotional relationship. So once you can establish what your relationship is with the asset and debt and your goals and all the other components, then make a decision. And if the decision is no, then don't look back, move forward. If the decision is yes, then activate. Well, that's good counsel. Um, you know, and my point is, if you're out there seeking optionality, creating a portfolio that gives you choices uh, later on uh, in life, you need to build it right at the front end, and that's where property strategists can certainly help. Um, you know, education can be you listen to this podcast and a thousand other podcasts, and then you make your move, or you uh, you do that uh, in parallel with actually reaching out to people that know what they're doing and actually getting the experts in to help you on that pathway. That was my choice, and it's worked well for me. I've used uh, the guys at the right property group for many years. So you guys are still open for business, aren't you, Vic? You still, yeah, I, I know I probably burned burned this friendship too many times over uh, uh, asking for uh, uh, help. Um, but um, you're, you're out there still doing it, mate. It, it, uh, the fact that you guys are more active today than what you were back in the days when we started doing stuff, I, I think gives, you know, sense to... Um, uh, the, the the growth of the the proposition of buyers agents, but the fact also you 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 want to be working with a buyers agent that's that's got a bit of scar tissue, been around a bit. I th yeah. I think I think that's really important that that we actually look at it that way, right? That that um, we've got um, advisors around you that have got scar tissue. Um, is it's really important um, to um, be able to be coached via life experience as opposed to textbook experience right so if you're looking at a surgeon right so someone that that's um you know um just came out of college never done never done a um appendectomy and he's going to operate on you uh as opposed to someone that's done thousand appendectomies who would you choose right and it's as simple as that um it is your financial future at the end of the day uh, and um, uh, you know, if if you look at it from from the viewpoint of uh, when is the best time to get started, right now, uh, next best time to start, well, actually the best time to get started is ten years ago, right? It always is, but what's the next best time to get started is right now, right? because in 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 a year, two years time, you look back and say, okay, we missed the boat there, but then the strategies will change, the areas will change at that point in time, right? So. You're not necessarily going to miss the market if you're not able to qualify um, uh, for for the right amount of money. Um, but when you do, you need to pull the trigger as quickly as possible so that you've got the longer term holding of the property, which then allows the growth and the and the easy easier exit strategies out of those properties. Mm, absolutely. So, um, if people want to have a yarn, Victor. What do they do? What's the best way to reach out to to you and the team? Well, we are um, a phone call, an email, or a social media message away. So, so, go so that, our... that could be today. So you could actually start today. You go. You could actually start today. So if you're listening to the podcast, regardless of what time it is, just send us a message. Uh, one of our team members will get back to you. Um, they will help you get ready with the right questions and the right mindset to then either uh, have a conversation with myself or Steve. Uh, then we'll re assess because when 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 I or Steve uh, talk with you. We don't want to be talking about, you know, how much do you uh, owe, all this sort of stuff. We want to be talking strategy. We want to be talking about how can we really help you using our expertise. Um, so th therefore, there is a bit of a process where we get all that information um, uh, prior to our meeting so that, uh, you know, either myself or Steve can sit down with that information first, formulate our thoughts using our experience. And then when we're having that meeting with you, 
we are actually uh, creating a strategy then and there and talking about what is possible and what's not possible. And we'd be very straightforward, uh, you know, if we do believe that, you know, now's not the right time for you, that you should really sit it out. Excellent. Well said. Yeah, good. Uh, Steve, just while I got you, mate, a quick question. Mate, apartment blocks. For some reason, I've got to be my bond around par- apartment blocks at the moment. They Can you still find them? No, they're very hard. There's a lot of yeah. listed and unlisted um, funds that are competing in that space. Um, and if they're there, they're too expensive at the moment. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's quite tactical, you know, to the point around asset selection, but you, you guys skewed us a, a block up in um, – Launton, Launton, uh, Launton. Um, oh, it'd be five, six years ago now, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I want more of them. So does everybody. I know. know. <laughs> it's uh, and look, it is really, really hard because, yeah, it, it, well, technically, it shouldn't be. Theoretically, it shouldn't be hard because the smaller complexes, which are just outside of commercial lending. There's not a lot of people that can afford that, mm. but a lot of people that own those complexes are not selling because the rents are through the roof and they probably held them for a hundred years and there's no necessity. Once you get over that sort of four or five sort of front door complex, you, you start to lurch into the commercial lending and that's when you start competing with the listed and unlisted funds. You know, obviously mm. the more bigger, deeper pockets. Um, I think like we look every day, um, they're just very, very hard to, to find that, you know, worth their salt. I guess. Yeah, yeah. The, the one you found us is excellent. Wish I had ten of them. You know, we all do. Yeah, It'd be awesome. Anyway, <laughs> that's it. That's optionality for you. You know, it is. It actually <laughs> you know, is. It, 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 it is. And 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 when you sort of get a portfolio which is you know a bit more robust, when you can start trading in those sort of areas, um, which is good fun. But anyway, uh, it's probably for a discussion for another time. Maybe we can do a whole thing on how to find apartment blocks. Uh, unstrated. That's what you know. That's what you want. That's what you want. But anyway, uh, for another time, um, that's it. Uh, Property Investing Insights of the Right Property Group. That's Steve Waters and Victor Kumar. Uh, you can start today. Um, um, and if you don't start today, there's always tomorrow. But my recommendation is that today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. So just get stuck into it right away. Uh, <laughs> do you like that? <laughs> that was like a bit... It was. It was uh, a bit of a tongue twister. Yeah. Today today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. So, yeah, just get on with it. Um, go check it out. Uh, um, right Property Group with an R, R-I-G-H-T, Right Property Group, rightpropertygroup.com. Right. There you go. Got it. They're all over the social media. Thanks for tuning, everyone. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. 